Okay, we're back, we're live, it's Community Matters, and we have the joy, <laughs> you know, the, the total delight of having Ian Lind with us today, ilind.net, okay? Thank you. Investigative reporter for about a thousand years. <laughs> Ian, we are delighted and honored to have you on the show. Thanks for coming Thank you down. very much, I'm glad to be here. Now, you participated in the show last Thursday, I shouldn't say show, it was a symposium. We called it the Morning Media Symposium. <laughs> at the yeah. Plaza Club upstairs, and you were a panelist in, in I guess, in Steve Petranek's panel, Correct. and you gave a, a really brilliant discussion. <laughs> so the first thing I, I'd like to know is where do you think that media symposium fits in the world of understanding media in our, in our state? Well, it, it helps underscore uh, why there's such disarray. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting points was a hypothetical was taken. If I had, if I could have hire twenty people to start a new media operation, what would I do? And the answers are very informative. I said, well, it depends what you want to do. Are you going to print something? Are you going to have a podcast? Are you going to have something that people can watch, like you do here? And uh, the data were very different. They had to explain. Look, writing stuff, you pay for um, reporters and editors, but that's not where your money is. When you get to a podcast. That takes time, that takes technology, that takes super amounts of editing, and videos even, can be even worse if you're not just telling a, a simple story. Um, so it depends what you want to do. If, if you wanted to do podcasts, you may only, you might have to have six people working on the podcast and three editors and da da da. And whereas you have reporters, if you had 20 people, maybe you could have 12 reporters and editors. And so it depends what you want to do, and that's difficult when all media now are being pressured to, to um, distribute their news in every different way they can. Yeah. Eyeballs right. and hits and whatnot. But yeah. all combined, right? You, don't, yeah. you can't choose which one to do because there's all this pressure right. um, to do all of them. I, I should tell a story here how much this has changed. So in um, 1999, I was working at the Star Bulletin, the old Honolulu Star Bulletin, when um, word came down that the t newspaper was going to be sold. And it ended up there was a lawsuit. It was the, became the first time in, in American history that we know of that a federal judge said, you can't stop publishing your newspaper under court order unless you make an attempt to sell it. Yeah, what about involuntary servitude? But never mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> well, I got caught in the middle. I thought, well, they told us we're going to close in 60 days. I said, well, what, what can I do in 60 days that's different? And we were hearing about all across the country newspapers being closed. So I said, I'll go online and I'll write about it every day. What's happening in the newsroom, what people are thinking, how we feel about it. What a great idea. What the news is. I yeah. thought 60 days, it'll be over. Yeah. Well, it stretched out for you know, a year and a half oh, before, no. before <laughs> things were finally settled. <laughs> Along the way, I decided, well, I just kept doing it. It was on my side. And at that time, there wasn't a word yet for blog. Right, blogging, the word blog was just coming into use, but wasn't really in general use yet. Yeah. So I didn't know I was doing a blog. I was just writing every day. So we got to, uh, uh, the newspaper was sold, and under the, it remains under that same management now with the combined newspaper. And we were all called in, told we had to be interviewed to retain our jobs. Okay, so happy, happy time for everyone. <laughs> happy time. I walked in and I got, I felt I was ambushed. Uh, the ed top editor who was there looked at me and said, well, Ian, do you think it's fair that you have a blog? I said, I said what? Um, I never thought about that. I said, do you think it's fair you have a newspaper? And things went down from there. But the bottom line is, if you go online and look up reporters fired for blogging, I became the first reporter in America that's recorded for having been f essentially losing their job for doing a blog. And actually and looking back, that was totally ridiculous. <laughs> because, well, because now, when now there's no expression, you have to have a blog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's how much time things have changed in 20 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. anyway, where, where were we? <laughs> okay, well, I was going to ask you about the stats you got out of your panel, because Steve Petranek is uh, like famous for stats, right? And he was reporting stats, and you were talking about stats. What stats uh, stick in your mind, Ian? Okay, well, he had the forty-seven percent of people overall in this survey preferred to watch their news rather than read or listen to their news. Forty-one percent, so pretty close, wanted to read, and nineteen percent preferred 
to listen to a podcast or, or audio, new NPR. So, and then when those, but when those are broken down, it was younger people who overwhelmingly wanted to read, 50 and older preferred watching, and 65 and older preferred watching by a great margin, two to one margin. So that, you don't really think about it that way. You think younger people are probably more in tune with all the tech things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting, because what you were talking about before it touches on something I wanted to ask you, and so does this. And it's the idea is um, the press um, does, whether you like it or not, whether it intends to do that or not, it does shape public opinion, sometimes sure. dramatically, some irreversibly, um, sometimes wrongly. Um, so the question is, to me, it's not necessarily hits. It's not necessarily what, you know, what age group. It's what do you do if you want to affect public opinion? See, that's a different question than if you are a businessman running a media business, you're wanting to know how do I monetize um, influence in public opinion? How do I monetize my daily news? My, in my own position, I never, I never had to do that. Um, the closest I came was I did a one-person newsletter for three or four years, three years actually, uh, about Hawaii uh, politics and money. And that was great fun because um, you could run between the legs of the daily news reporters and get all kinds of stories right. that they Nimble. missed. Nimble. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that's still the case and probably would be more the case now than it was then because now you have more tools. Now you have your phone can give you broadcast quality video and audio. Um, your, your laptop computer can be your, work, your workplace, your office, wherever you are. Um, you have sixth graders who take their iPad and make really nice looking videos that you see on television sometimes now. Um, it's a different world. And there's much more that um, a single person or a small group of people could do. Um, you're doing it here. You get a bigger group of people, but, but you are an example of nimble, small-scale, think-little media and news production. Yeah, well, we, we like the idea of reaching out to people, and we like the idea of touching things, as you do, mm -hmm. uh, that mean something, that are maybe sacred cows, and we'll talk yeah. about that later. Uh, but I, I, just, uh, I just wonder, what, if, if you were going to start scratch, and, and making a profit, bottom line, doesn't matter, how would you affect more people, affect their thinking, um, how, would you, how would you shape public opinion? Um, in these days, there's a good reason for that, because uh, uh, the question I asked at the end during your panel, I was sort mm -hmm. of trying to get at that, is that shaping public opinion actually can be converted into money. Uh, if you effectively, like uh, Cambridge Analytica, mm -hmm. can shape public opinion and elections, somebody will pay you for that. Uh, look at Facebook, that's what's happening. Right. Um, so my question is, what, what, what techniques would you use? What media would you select? Uh, what approach would you take to shape public opinion in a big way? Whoa, that's a toughie. Um, I guess I'd be on television. My own experience was, okay, I publish a newsletter, and I beat the dailies on the story, and my, my 1,000 or 1,200 readers got to read that, and everybody felt good. <laughs> so then it was picked up by the daily newspapers, and they'd run a story. But then every once in a while, and actually for a short period of time, I had a deal where I'd appear on television, um, and I discussed that story. Well, when I was on television, everybody would say, hey, Ian, I heard about your story, or I read your story, or I heard your story. That was really great. Later, I was on the, worked at the Star Bulletin, had these front page headline investigative stories across the newspaper. And someone would say, oh, your newspaper wrote a good, had a good story. I forget what it was about, um, who, and I said, well, that's my story, and the people had no idea. So th I found, for whatever reason, at least at that time, that television um, appearance was worth five times what the front page appearance was worth, and ten times what my newsletter was worth, <laughs> except that you have to look at the food chain. In my view, you don't really necessarily want to affect the most people because that's when you have to lower yourself down to the you know, lowest common denominator. Country, yes. You want to affect um, opinion leaders, those, those who other people look to when, they, when they're trying to decide, what should I think about this? I'll, I'll check out what so-and-so says. Or the people in your school or in your workplace who um, drive opinion. Those are the people you want to reach. And I think those people are probably more discerning and want more detail 
and more substance than the average um, television viewer or newspaper reader. Mm. And so, you know, to get the most people, you really got to dumb down. I, mean, yeah. I hate to say it that way, but that's yeah. really what you need that's to a do. Big problem. And and but to give people the ammunition, ammunition they need, you need to detail up, smash in as much as you can. You know, I, I like to bounce something off you. I've been thinking about this lately. Sure. It it's, uh, comes out of um, Mr. Palmieri, who is my seventh grade teacher. <laughs> he taught me repetitio mater studiorum, which was Latin for repetition is the mother of study. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, you write for the newspaper, you have a blog, and television, uh, radio, whatever it is. So if you, if you hit it three times or four, even twice, you're having a multiplier effect. Yes. Your rep repetition is the mother of study. You're, you're getting in there, and if I'm a viewer, listener, reader, and I hear it twice, three times, four times, it takes on much more than if I heard it only once on one media. Do you agree with me about that? Do you think that you can gr have a greater effect on public opinion if you can have the multiplier effect in multiple media? Definitely, and, and over time. Not just multiple media, <clears throat> but more importantly, over time. You hear it this week, and then next week, Two weeks from now, there's a follow-up story that's adds some more detail or takes a different angle. And pretty soon, you might actually remember that, oh, I remember this is an issue that's been around for a while. Um, so that's, that's really important to, to have a follow-through and momentum on a story. The little, your things that come and go on a daily basis, they disappear. But if they're cumulative, that's where you get your impact. Yeah. I remember a, a story about um, somebody wanted to plant false news, fake news. And uh, maybe this was Cam Cambridge Analytica. And they started by putting it in a completely unknown newspaper in some unknown city in, in India. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it sat there. It sat there for months. And then they, they played it again. And this time they, they quoted the story out of the Indian newspaper as if that had some credibility to right. it. <laughs> and they sort of leveraged the thing up, you know, and it, it was geometric. It was quite, quite remarkable. But let me, let me go to the next thing I want to ask you about. Sure. I was stunned. I was delighted. I was so happy when you went through your your thing about um, sacred, sacred uh, cows, because I, it's totally true. We live, in a, we live in a very unusual place without characterizing it. It's different, yeah. this place. And we have sacred cows. We don't touch with a 10-foot pole. And the result is we don't learn about them, and we don't criticize them, and we don't change them. Can you, can you sort of summarize what you were saying that day last week? Sure. Um, I use this technique as a way of finding stories that an investigative reporter willing to go beyond the daily beat could beat everybody else, right? Even though they're out there every day producing stories. And so I thought I would sit down and think about what are the institutions or individuals or, or organizations that affect our lives, affect a whole bunch of people, but that we don't really see in the news. We don't know much, so we don't know much about, so there's no public accountability. For your panel, I went through and I made my my current, what I would say my current list, and at the top of that list, I would put, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to phrase this, the Hawaiian community. Okay, we have all these issues on the front pages now for months, and on the weekly front pages for years, TMT, for example. But we don't know, and have no little sense of, and reporters don't seem to know, well, who are the institutions in the Hawaiian community who have, probably have opinions about this that may not be expressed. You know, we have a very vibrant Hawaiian community out there, the Hawaiian Civic Clubs, the uh, Homestead Associations, um, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, you've got all uh, nonprofits, the Ali'i Trusts, um, the Royal, the royal uh, Societies, um, and, and we don't cover these things. You know, you, you could have a whole beat, somebody covering all of the state's Hawaiian civic clubs and all the fights and the politics and who's going where and who's saying what about whom, it would be a fascinating look. Um, so when it comes down to suddenly we have a current issue and it's making headlines and we only know what a, f a few vocal people in the center of these protests, for example, we only know what they think about it. But what about the broader community? Where are they? Where, where are the tensions? Where are the differences? Um, that's why I say, it, to me, that's a sacred cow that proper reporting ongoing over a period of time would, would give us more understanding of how you might resolve this otherwise, you know, impossible situation. Opaque. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. It, and, and it just reminds me of one thing before we go on to the next sure. sacred cow is that is that people don't understand how hard it is to be a reporter, uh, yeah. to write an email and ask for things, to pick up the phone and ask for things, go wait out somebody's office and wait and ask for things. Because most people, they don't, they don't want to talk to you. They don't <laughs> right. like reporters. They don't like the media. They don't want to be embarrassed or worse. And so they don't talk to you. And so to be a reporter really requires some really important people skills and persistence. Am I right? Very much so. This raises one of the other significant points that came up during the, the panel discussion. Um, and that was Peter Rossig from Hawaiian Electric. He used to be a very good um, reporter and editor. Peter said, you know, uh, he's been working at Hawaiian Electric for some time. Um, dealing with the news media. And he said in the old days, you know, you'd get these grizzled old business reporters who knew everything about your business and they could put you on the spot, but they could also take the information you gave them and understand it and they knew what they were doing and you worried when they walked into your office because you were really going to get grilled. He says, now you get young um, kind of general assignment reporters are sent over, you know, Mr. Rossi, what do you do? What? What's going on sure. with And here's my press release. Yes. And exactly. it's really well written. Why don't you use this? But no, what's worse, he said, <laughs> I want them to understand. He wants them to understand, but there's you know, no level of the, the background isn't there. They don't have the background that reporters, beat reporters used to have. People who covered a particular area so they knew the issues, they knew the people, they knew the companies. Now, one of the other panelists responded to that. In a, he kind of said, well, you know, actually this works out really well because the audience doesn't know anything either. And so, and so your reporters who are fresh and come to a fresh look, they'll, know, they'll be able to, to s explain that to the, the general audience. So we can all be in oblivion together. <laughs> well, I, it took me a while. I had to go home and look at my notes and go, you know, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but I don't know how to get around that because, again, like, like um, investigative reporters are expensive. And beat reporters who are retained because they know their beat and they've built credibility over time. And, and the Rolodex. The Rolodex, and the Rolodex, Rolodex is Rolodex, everything. Um, you know, that's expensive too. And so I don't know how you get around this. How do you make that business sustainable economically while at the same time um, holding on to the things that worked in the past? That now, now they see as fuddy-duddy, you know, having beat reporters assigned. That was a luxury of an old, an old day gone by. And yet, I'm not sure how you, how you function without it. Well, you must have some thoughts about how, you, how the press, how the media can be sustainable in this city and uh, perhaps in the country. There must be things that can be done. Are you nibbling away at that issue? Well, I went back and we had a, we had a friend who was a former university professor who through the Vietnam War era, got kicked out of his university. And so, anyway, he ended up with the, having a small group of friends, six, they may be, maybe like a half a dozen people. And for 20 years, they put on what they called the Great Atlantic Radio Conspiracy. It was a, a weekly radio program on a specific issue, whether it was an economic issue, a social Every issue, a political a issue. One. Hmm? Every week a different one. Every week a different one. They used, they cut a deal with the local community college um, radio station, so they got radio time, the studio time, like this. And for 20 years, they put out this series of things. They weren't paid. Everybody had day jobs. But they were committed. Um, and, and they got very good at what they did. I, you know, it's hard to come up with an analogy of that today. Of um, um, and translated into money. And well, see, sometimes you have to. We got a lot of retired reporters, a lot of underemployed reporters because of all the cutbacks in news for the last twenty years. Um, you have people, you know. I and my wife worked at the university, so when I was unemployed and, and started a newsletter instead, um, I could fall back on that cushion, and that helped me get through. Yeah. But it, it also showed that with. If you had a position to cut you a little slack, you could get a lot done media-wise. So are you saying that uh, the future of the press is in altruism? Uh, it's in volunteerism? It's in citizen journalism? Uh, no, only looking at it from the bottom. As, you know, I'm, I'm a news consumer most of the time, yeah. until I get mad and say, you know, 
I can do better than that, and I'll <laughs> sh shoot out a blog post or something. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for the little things that people can do, and let, let somebody else take it up the chain, you know? When I did my newsletter, eventually after three years, I got a job offer. I'd never worked in a newspaper, I never took a journalism class, but I was beating reporters every month. Um, <laughs> now, that, maybe that's, that's one way, as people cut, you know, cut their chops on, on, the on their independent media, and then become part of the business, and they, they're going to change um, from the inside. They're going to help change the way things are going, yeah. I would hope. Yeah, I, I, but you know, my thing about uh, Repetitio Mater Studiorum actually does translate into money. If you noticed, uh, every time you look at Kindle, every time you look, uh, some reporter is writing a book. Some of them write a couple of books a year, maybe more. And they sell those books, they promote those books wherever they appear. Yep. The result is they're making money individually, I suppose, because sure. their media is not really benefiting. <clears throat> and that's a way to make it sustainable, at least for them. The right. other thing, the other thing is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, um, movies. Take a look at Frontline, right? One of my favorite right. things. Those, those guys, the ones who are writing it, thinking it through, doing the investigation, they're reporters. And they're making but, money with that. But the problem with that model is those front lines cost a million bucks. Or, they you do know. indeed. Right. Now, I think the other way. I think, you know, since an eight-year-old with a phone can go and produce an interview with a newsmaker that none of us get to see because all we get are sound bites, and make that available for free the same way you do on YouTube, why aren't we, why aren't we seeing more of that? Why, why don't... You know, how disruptive would that be when you, when you, when you would come to the 6 o'clock news and say, why do I need to watch for 15 seconds? I can go over here and I can watch an hour interview with somebody who would be really interesting and helpful for me to know, and they only give them 15 seconds on the news. That's something we can do today, and I'm not sure how you package that. You're as close as I know. Well, I think the word packaging is critical. You yeah. have to provide the platform. You have to make it happen every day or whenever yeah. you, whatever interval you're, you're promising. And then you get that fresh news. You get the fresh approach. You get people who are really out there, you know, thinking outside the box. Yeah. And that, I, I want to see that always. Uh, that, you know, that's my, my passion. But you've got to provide a platform. And the platform costs money. Yeah. Uh, so it's somewhere in the middle of all of that yes. where I think the future lies. But let's, uh, let's go back to uh, some, some uh, sacred cows. Uh, we, we only got started with we, one. We got started. Other? I got my other, others on my list. I like Hawaii airports as a sacred cow. You know, they've been in the news recently, the worst airport in the country almost is Honolulu. <laughs> um, and the airports are an institution, part of our state government, that doesn't have the normal accountability one reason, for example, is they have a dedicated source of funding. So when legislators and the transportation committees rumple and fuss and say, oh, got, you guys get in here and show us, tell us why things are so screwed up, or we're going to cut, oh, we can't cut your budget because your budget's guaranteed because it comes from all those airline fees and concession <laughs> fees. So the airports can basically say, mm -hmm, you know, get lost. They're, they're uncovered except when on those occasions when the fraud and abuse um, become so bad that somebody's busted and goes to the slammer and has a trial and whatever. And, and that goes through the news cycle for maybe three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the airports are also, they're landlords, they're landowners, um, they have all those problems, they're environmental centers for um, th where their environmental impact needs to be examined. Um, it's a bureaucratic empire that used to be much more political, but now it may be that the politics are just behind the scenes. And, and, and the bureaucracy because, rules. But we don't know because we don't report on them. There's no airport, well, the legislature has been trying to form the airport authority, and it, at its best, the airport authority would provide some public window. They'd have to have public meetings, et cetera. Um, whether that's going to happen in that way. There's a benefit in that alone. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, after that, uh, I say, how about real estate? You know, real estate is a big business. It's not just your glossy, oh, look at the house in, in my neighborhood that's for sale, either too high or too low for me to worry about. Um, it's a business. Every month, the state produces a list of people in that business who have been fined for violating the rules or violating the laws. Sometimes they lose their licenses. Sometimes they just pay fines. What are, what's going on behind the scenes? What drives that business? Um, 
how, do, how does the real estate industry affect the housing market? Um, how, does the real, how has the real estate industry in the past um, fed the problem of illegal rentals, people renting their bedroom, a, a bedroom closet or outside <laughs> thing with a, you know extension cord run to the, to the outside shed? I mean, this is what's happening, and, people, and, and the real estate industry pushes that because it provides more housing for people, and it does, but it also drives the price of housing up, just like Airbnb kind of things do. So the real estate industry, um, I put organized labor in there. You know, people com a lot of people complain, you know, though, it's those unions that push the legislature around. And gets, they always get what they want. And yet we don't know much at all about what goes on inside those unions. You know? We, we can't name their officials, really. And maybe uh, the no, top guy, but, you know. But not, not even that. We, most people couldn't even name, well, what are the big kind of different kinds of unions and or do, they get, do they get along or not get along? How about the private worker unions versus the public worker unions or the AFSPE unions versus whoever, you know, we just don't know. And, we, and because we don't know, we don't inform their members or the general public um, how to understand the issues surrounding those unions. Mm. Two, two things pop to mind. One is what you were saying about the Native Hawaiian community, uh -huh. um, and that is we, we may know the very top level, we know, may know what they want us to know in press releases, but we don't know what's going on. We can't even name the people. Uh -huh. um, the other thing is uh, that, that um, um, it, it's just, it's not, it's not raw meat, right? It's boring. Real estate, oh, boring. Um, people don't want to hear about this stuff. They don't want to hear, what we need is somebody who will dig down in the detail and tell us yeah. exactly how it works, educate us about these institutions. We need that. Correct. Are we going to get that? <laughs> I'm not holding my breath. But um, I mean, I sure hope that people are going to emerge to do that. And there are editors out there looking for good ideas, and maybe they're going to stumble on some of these. They have to pay for those. <laughs> anyway, one last question. We're sure. almost out of time, and that is, uh, you know, I'm very interested in um, advocacy journalism, where the newspaper, I mean, I'm just a, a wild example, the Civil Beat decides they want to write about climate change all year. Um, like, we shouldn't forget it. And indeed, we shouldn't forget it. And in order, you know, you've got to get by the, haven't we heard this before, sy syndrome, mm -hmm. and write about some different aspect every week, every day, whatever it is. And you have to write action points, not just, yes, we have climate change. I heard that already. You've got to write something new. Um, it's the same thing with advocacy in general. You, you attack something, and you work on it, and work on it, work on it. And when you do that, I just want your reaction to this. When you, when you do that, you really have to take a, a moral position, a position that the editor feels is going to improve the community. You know, one, one thing uh, just to sort of sure. set the stage for you is Act 221, where Sean Howe spent 10 years beating up Act 20, 20, 221. And at the end of that 10 years, Linda Lingle, to her delight, you know, killed it. Um, and and I, I just at the middle of that period, there was a headline, banner, okay? And it said, Act 221 investors found to be wealthy. Holy moly. Now that's a revelation. You can see how, how down the Honolulu advertiser was on Act 221 because people love to hear those raw meat stories. So my question to you is, you know, can we achieve something where the newspaper actually takes a moral position that benefits the community? And B, is there anything wrong with advocacy type journalism? Well, are newspapers going to do it? I doubt it because the the accepted professional norm is you have an editorial side that can editorialize all they want, can scream and yell, can be the Wall Street Journal for business. But when it comes to your news side, you try and be straight and narrow, down the, down the center, make it you know, as accurate and as full and complete as you can and let people draw their, and not, not be driven by the editorial positions. That's always been, that's the, been the traditional approach. Um, but what we have now is raw meat rules. Yes. So if, I, if I'm up on top of the mountain making a mess and threatening people and death threats, what have you, and stopping everybody, um, I get the press every time I do that. I, I, can, I can systematically achieve headline status with those stories. And meanwhile, uh, other media is saying, wait a minute, uh, telescopes are good for us. Uh, are they saying that and in as regular a basis? And after, what, six months of this, actually more, sure. um, how has public opinion been, been affected? It seems to me that part of the problem here is the way the media has handled it. And the way the participants have 
have um, done their job from their point of view. Um, the TMT opponents have, been, have had a dynamite um, public relations program driven by social media, uh, one that took, I think took everyone aback. No one was considered that they would be this successful for this long. Um, but I think you are right that the failure of the media is, oh, we filled our TMT quota for today, so don't bother digging any deeper or getting the other side or, or fleshing out the, the um, a picture. That, that's it for today. On to tomorrow. And tomorrow is more courts, crime, protests, and automobile accidents. Right. <laughs> so I don't, I, I, we obviously have, I mean, there, there have been crusading newspapers in our past, and more, you know, that's really yellow journalism, that, that whole <laughs> attitude towards careful, that kind yeah. of thing. However, I do think that, um, you know, in the future, partly is going to be um, uh, nonprofit journalism, right? Journalism that relies on grants and donations and whatever. But I think partly is going to be more organizations setting up their own news sources, whether it's unions, um, nonprofits. You know, HMSA has a their not their news thing going. I don't think it, if you if you had news people news people running it, it would look different. But the unions have newspapers. Again, if they had newspaper people running them, they'd look different and be more effective. Um, but those are, those are institutions that have some money, have an interest in um, affecting public opinion, and are in a position to, to fund it as they go along. So I, th I think we are going to see more of that as well, uh, adding to competition with the mainstream daily media. Yeah, yeah. Wow, there's more, there's more, Ian. And, um, you know, we hope you agree that we should get back together again and explore these things. Because, you know, whatever we size up as the issues of the day, there'll be more tomorrow. That's right. Exactly right. That's the name of the game. So one last thing is, at this program, um, me for the first panel and Steve for the second panel asked you to summarize and asked you to come up with a word. I don't know if you actually came up with a word, but I would like you to do that now. Um, <laughs> confusion. <laughs> I think that's, you know, look at what's going on in the media all over the country. Everyone is searching for the holy grail that no one has found on how to make this happen the best with the best impact for the public um, and the most accountability also for the public. Great discussion. Ian. All right. Hey, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>